Uh, hello there. I hope you're doing great. So today we meet once again and uh, we are going to continue with uh, looking at some of these questions and uh, we are proceeding with the UCU uh, past paper of 2021 that is CP2 and we are going to look at uh, question number seven. So ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome and uh, basically for those who do not have uh, a copy of the question as we have always been doing we are going to ensure that uh, I take you through the question so question number seven basically states that uh, when it comes to doing away with interlocutory uh, experte or default judgments the procedure seems to be one and the same but in real sense it is different discuss the distinction between the non-procedures for setting aside judgments entered without affording a party hearing, including judgments arising from specially endorsed planes. So the question carries uh, 20 marks. I don't know why students are finding this question um, a bit challenging, but I will help you take you through the same. Now, from the onset, it's important to note that it's, it's hard to enter a civil procedure paper and then uh, either an interlocutory judgment or an ex parte or default judgment uh, or um, a default judgment under order uh, 36 is not in the exam. So in one way or the other, you'll always find one or two of these elements in the exam. So during this discussion, we are going to examine this question but we'll also be looking at the principles governing interlocutory, ex parte, and default judgments in general. So that when you meet them next time, even if there is a small twist in the setting, you're still equipped enough to answer such a question. So we are going to be doing both, answering this question, but also looking at those different types of judgments a little bit more in detail. So basically, uh, this question required a student or requires a student basically to discuss okay, the distinction between the procedures of how you set aside an interlocutory, ex parte or default judgment, and then also looking at uh, Order 36, uh, Rule 11, which provides for how um, you set aside um, uh, a default judgment entered uh, under summary procedure. So we're going to be looking at that in detail and comparing the difference uh, within the procedures. And that is all that really the question requires. Now, from the onset, it's important to note that uh, uh, objectively speaking, there is little difference in the procedures. Okay, There are very, very minor differences. We shall be highlighting them. Uh, and most of the differences really uh, are in the law. Okay, Are really in the law the law within which you have to proceed when you are uh, uh, looking at any of those various types of judgments where you intend to set them aside. But generally speaking, the procedures are more or less the same. So we are in total agreement with the question that the procedures are very similar with extremely minor differences. So let's start right away uh, by looking at, uh, basically when we are discussing the procedure, we are going to start by looking at the interlocutory judgments, okay? So we are going to start with those. Uh, so you need to know first what is an interlocutory judgment. You need to know the definition. And basically, an interlocutory judgment um, is an immediate, is an intermediate judgment that determines a preliminary or subordinate point or plea, but doesn't finally decide the case or the matter, okay? Please look at the Black Laws Dictionary, 9th edition, page 919 uh, by Brian A. Garner. The definition will be found there. So basically that is an interlocutory judgment. And you need to note that that interlocutory judgment doesn't finally decide the case. This is what you have to note. It does not finally decide the case. Now, having known what that interlocutory judgment is, okay, then let's proceed to look at the law, okay? What law provides for this interlocutory judgment? Look at the civil procedure rules, okay? Order 9, Rule 8 provides for such interlocutory judgments. 
and it provides that an interlocutory judgment may be entered where a plaint is drawn for one pecuniary damages only or for detention of goods with or without a claim for pecuniary damages now where the defendant fails and that is where the defendant fails okay very important to note so the interlocutory judgment is only entered where the defendant fails to file a defense within the stipulated days okay also important to note is that pecuniary damages require formal proof whereas liquidated damages are stated in the plaint okay but what you should note is that such a type of judgment is only entered where uh, the defendant file fails to file a defense within the stipulated time okay and also interlocutory judgments amount or rather emanate from a plaint this is actually one of the of the differences okay between interlocutory uh, judgments and other judgments for example such as the default judgment emanating from order 36 okay which of course for that one uh, it only arises where a suit has been brought by way of uh, which has been brought by way of specially lost plaint okay so let's proceed. Um, I invite you to look at the authority of uh, Dembe Trading Enterprises Limited versus Uganda uh, Confidential Limited, HCT 00CS0612. Now, in that, in that case, court held that Order 9 Rule 8 okay, uh, of the Civil Procedure Rules uh, for an interlocutory judgment applies for a plaint for a claim for pecuniary damages and that before such a judgment is made there must be proof of effective service of summons and the time for filing the written statement of defense must have elapsed so in summary the court was saying that for you to proceed and apply for an interlocutory judgment one the time for filing a written statement of defense must have elapsed okay for the other party or also secondly there must be proof of effective service when you look under rule 5 it provides that you must have put on court record an affidavit of service that is simply what uh, the court was emphasizing now important also to note that once an interlocutory judgment is entered the suit must be set aside for formal proof as to the quantum of damages and other unliquidated claims. Authority for that position will be found in the case of Haja Suman Mutekanga versus Equator Growers. It's a Supreme Court decision number seven of 1995. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're able then to draw that distinction. Uh, so let's proceed uh, to look now at the procedure, okay? We are going now to look at the procedure governing interlocutory judgments. Uh, the procedure for setting aside, okay? The procedure for setting aside an interlocutory judgment. So basically the procedure is as follows. The first step is you draft a notice of motion supported by an affidavit, okay? Authority, Order 59, Rule 1 of the Civil Procedure Rules, and order 9 rule 8 of the same rules are authoritative okay uh, the grounds that you include in your notice of motion uh, or that the grounds that you rely on are uh, one is non-service of summons uh, for non-service of summons of course you look at order 9 rule 5 of the civil procedure rules which provide uh, in summary that an affidavit of service must be on court record very important to note then also the second ground that you can rely on is, uh, is that there is a plausible defense. So if you're able to prove or show that you have a plausible defense, then you can also rely that on, uh, you can rely on that as a ground. The second step is you pay the requisite filing fees in court, which of which the fees are 3,300 shillings. The third step is you serve a copy on the respondent. Authority is under order nine rule 18. Okay, which provides that there is no decree uh, that will be set aside without notice to the opposite party. 
So serving a copy to the respondent is of paramount importance. Then the fourth step is uh, you file an affidavit of service on court record. Look at Order 5 Rule 16 of the Civil Procedure Rules. It is authoritative on that. Then the last step, of course, is that the suit will be set down for hearing. So basically that is the procedure for setting aside an interlocutory judgment. So let's proceed to, to look at uh, the ex parte, an ex parte judgment. Now, what is an ex parte judgment? An ex parte judgment, basically, this is a judgment made at the instance and for the benefit of one party only. Okay? And without notice to or argument by any person adversely interested in the matter. So basically that is an ex parte judgment. Now having known what an ex parte judgment is, let's then proceed to look at the law. What is the law that provides for this ex parte judgment? Uh, order 9. You look at Order 9, Rule 20, Sub Rule 1A of the Civil Procedure Rules, which provides that court may proceed ex parte where it is satisfied that the defendant was served and only the plaintiff appeared. Of interest also, look at the case of Twine, of Twine Amos versus Tamusuza James, and that is Civil Revision Number 11 of 2009. Now, in that case, court held that when Court held that when he failed to file the defense, the defendant stroke applicant opened the door for the plaintiff to proceed ex parte in the suit. Very important to note. So the moment you, you fail okay, to lodge or to put in your defense, then you would have opened the gate for the plaintiff to proceed and apply that the suit should be had ex parte under Order 9. Rule 20. Okay, very, very important to note. Also of interest is the case of uh, Abedeng Absalom Ongom versus Amos Kaheru. It's a case of 1995, uh, Volume 3, Kampala Law Reports. In that case, court held that where a defendant does not appear, having filed a written statement of defense and the trial proceeds ex parte, Remedies cannot be granted to the plaintiff just as prayed unless they are sufficiently supported by the pleadings. Okay, very important to note. Also, once a matter is fixed for hearing, the plaintiff must file a scheduling memorandum. The plaintiff must also lead evidence even if the matter is proceeding ex parte. Okay, he must lead evidence, he must file a joint scheduling memorandum, and they must make submissions and the court will enter judgment accordingly in favor for the plaintiff if he or she has proved the case okay to the satisfaction of court or to the required standard under civil procedure which is a balance of probabilities now having noted that let's now proceed <clears throat> to look at uh, the procedure for setting aside an ex parte judgment because don't forget this is what our question is about okay our question is about the procedure for setting aside uh, these types of judgments and whether indeed there is a distinction okay and from the onset as i told you there is a little distinction between these procedures they are more or less the same the differences are very minor and they are mi mainly in the law okay so the procedure for setting aside an ex parte judgment uh, the first step, it's as follows. The first step is, one, you draft a notice of motion plus an affidavit in support. Authority is Order 52 Rule 1 and Order 9 Rule 27. After that, you, you we, let's, let's now look at the grounds, okay? The grounds to rely on in the application. The first ground is non-service of summons and the second ground is any sufficient cause that may have prevented you from appearing. To defend the suit. Um, I invite you to look on that second ground, you look at the case of Nyombi versus Anne Maria Nalongo. It's a case of 1987, High Court Bullet, page 82. In that case, court held uh, that reasons for setting aside an expected judgment are unlimited. The reasons are so many, they are endless. 
So having looked at the grounds that you would include in your notice of motion, let's proceed now to look at the second uh, step. The second step is you pay the requisite fees in the court, and we say that those requisite fees are 3,300 shillings. The third step, you proceed to serve a copy to the respondent. Authority is Order 9, Rule 18 of the Civil Procedure Rules, which we already looked at. Then the fourth step is to file an affidavit of service on court record. Authority, look at Order 5, Rule 16 of the Civil Procedure Rules, and also the case of Edison, Kanyewera versus Pastori, Tumwebaze. Okay, it's a Supreme Court civil, uh, it's a Supreme Court decision, Supreme Court civil suit, uh, number 6 of 2014. In that case, court held that absence of an affidavit of service means that the defendant wasn't properly served. So service uh, of uh, an affidavit, rather filing of an affidavit of service is always very important. Then the last step is to, uh, you, 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 you wait for the matter, okay? The hearing of the application then proceeds on a fixed date. So that is the procedure for setting aside an ex parte judgment. And you realize that when you compare the procedure of uh, an ex parte, of setting aside an ex parte judgment, and the procedure of setting aside um, an interlocutory judgment, they are more or less the same. Actually, they are very, very similar, with the difference being only in the law. Okay, so let's proceed to look at um, uh, a default uh, default judgment. Now, with a default judgment, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's start by looking at what is a default judgment in itself. It's very important to always know the definition. So a default judgment basically is a judgment entered not on the merits because the parties may not be heard. So a default judgment is one that court enters without going into the details of the case, without necessarily hearing the merits of the case, but court goes on to make such a judgment. Now, this default judgment uh, arises where a party properly served with summons, fails to respond by way of written statement of defense if it's an ordinary suit, okay? Or fails to apply for leave to appear and defend the suit if it is for a specially endorsed plaint under Order 36. So meaning that a default judgment can either be under Order 36 or it can be under Order 9, Rule 6. Very important to note, okay? Meaning that, I emphasize, a default judgment, it may be entered either under Order 9, Rule 6 of the Civil Procedure Rules, or it can also be entered under Order 36, Rule 3, Sub-Rule 2 of the Civil Procedure Rules. Any of those, a default judgment can be entered by court. Uh, of course, as we said, the matter has to be fixed for formal uh, proof. That is always important to note. Uh, then also of uh, importance is Order 9, Rule 6 and 7 of the Civil Procedure Rules, and it provides that a default judgment can be invoked where there is a claim for liquidated demand. Uh, look also at the case of Twine Amos versus Tamusuza James, which is Civil Revision Number 11 of 2009. Court held that a liquidated demand refers to a claim of an amount of money which is fixed or ascertained, and damages are unliquidated. Damages are unliquidated. Important to note. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, that is it to note on uh, what a default judgment is. Now, let's proceed. I wanted us to briefly also look at the procedure for applying for a default judgment before we can go now to the procedure of setting aside okay but the, this 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 question can be twisted a little bit okay next time and i can assure you you will always find a question there will always be a question on these types of judgments in your exam so we are now briefly going to look at the procedure for applying for a default judgment now this is not required to be part of the question when you're answering 
okay? You're not supposed to look at the procedure for applying for a default judgment. But however, it's important for us to talk about it at this stage because you, will, you may find it in your exam and it's very important for you to know it. So we are now going to look at the procedure for applying for a default judgment. What is the procedure in case the other party either doesn't file a written statement of defense or maybe they don't uh, put in their application to our appear and defend the suit under order 36. What procedure do you follow to apply for a default judgment? And this procedure applies for both order 9, rule 6, and order 36, rule 3. It applies for both. So the procedure is as follows. One, lodging an ordinary letter to a trial magistrate or the register of the high court. So you can apply by way of ordinary letter. That is the first step. The second step is uh, the, letter, the letter must also clearly state that the defendant was served with summons and did not file a defense or failed to appear and defend that suit. So very, very important to note. Then also, the letter must also show that there is an affidavit of service on the court file. Next, it is also prudent practice. It is prudent practice that an extracted copy of the default judgment is attached for the court to sign and seal. It is important to note, okay, in this procedure, that where it is the attorney general, no default judgment shall be entered. No default judgment shall be entered where it is the attorney general without prior notice to the attorney general. Meaning that a default judgment against the attorney general will only be entered after giving them notice. Okay? Very, very important. And also, leave of court must be sought and obtained before entering the judgment. Okay? Very, very important to note. Now, having discussed in material detail the procedure for applying for a default judgment, let's now go back okay, to our question and we'll look at the procedure for setting aside a default judgment under Order 9, Rule 6 and 7 of the Civil Procedure Rules. This is the procedure and it is more or less the same. Uh, the first step is you draft a notice of motion supported by an affidavit as we earlier looked at. Uh, the law, Order 52, Rule 1 and Order 9, Rule 6. That is the difference in the procedure. It is mainly on the law. Uh, of course, the grounds are more or less uh, the same with what we looked at earlier. And uh, these include non-service of summons and any other sufficient cause. The third step is to pay requisite fees. After that, the next is to serve a copy to the respondent. The next step is to file an affidavit of service. You put it on court record. And then the last step is hearing of the application. So you realize that the procedures are more or less the same, just like the question had earlier stipulated. Let's now proceed finally to look at uh, default judgment. Okay, let's look at uh, the procedure for setting aside the default judgment under a specially endorsed plaint or under order 36 rule 11 of the civil procedure rules. So the procedure basically is as follows. The first step is you draft a notice of motion supported by an affidavit, authority order 52 rule 1 and order 36 rule 11 of the civil procedure rules. Uh, the second step uh, before we go to the second step, let's look at the grounds. Which grounds would you include in your application? The first ground is uh, service of summons, uh, non-effective summons, basically. Okay, that's one of the grounds. The second ground is uh, any other good cause. If there is any other reason that is of sufficient uh, good cause, it can also be relied on. The second step is to pay the requisite fees. Uh, we already stated what the fees are. 3,300 shillings. The next step is to serve a copy on the respondent. Uh, the other step is to file an affidavit of service on court record. And finally, you wait for the hearing of the application. So basically, that is the procedure, okay, uh, for setting aside these types of uh, judgments uh, 
uh, and you will quickly realize, as I have been emphasizing from the beginning, that the difference is very minimum. So, if you're concluding your question, you should highlight as follows. That one, the procedures between setting aside interlocutory judgment and expert judgment and default judgments, both under Order 9 and Order 36, are more or less similar. The difference being, one, in the laws that provide for setting aside such judgments. Secondly, the other difference it all, the other difference also lies in uh, default judgments under Order 9 and under Order 36. Being that under Order 9, okay, you only you, you apply where the other party fi fails to put in a defense, and normally under Order 9, such types of suits would have been commenced by way of ordinary plaint. Whereas under Order 36, Rule 11, you're setting aside a suit that was commenced by way of special endorsed plaint. Those are some of the differences between the two, but predominantly these procedures are more or less the same. In so doing, you would have concluded your question and you would able to get your full marks. So please put emphasis on these types of judgments. They barely miss in any exam. I wish you the best. Please do not forget to subscribe to this channel so that you're always able to get continuous updates on the same. God bless you. See you another, another day. Bye-bye.